Well, we've given you another problem to work on that's not too much different from the one you worked on last time. Um, we have a three-layer problem. Uh, how, the only difference um, is between layers two and three. In layers one and two, we have an increase in velocity. We've got velocities increasing from layer one of 4,600 meters per second into layer two with a velocity of 5,800 meters per second. We have increases in density as well. So we have a positive reflection coefficient. But as we go from layer two to layer three, we have a reduction in the uh, velocity back to the velocity in layer one. We also have a reduction in the density uh, back to the density in layer one. So we basically flip the sign of the reflection coefficients. This will give us a negative pressure wave uh, reflection coefficient. And remember that a negative, remember the relationship between the, re, the velocity reflection coefficient and the pressure uh, reflection coefficient. Uh, the velocity uh, wave reflection coefficient is basically the negative of the pressure wave reflection coefficient. So in this case, that velocity reflection coefficient will be positive, which means that the particles, the lead, the the particle displacements on the leading edge of the wavefront are going to be moving downward. So as you've begun to fill out this problem, uh, fill out this table, uh, you've seen that the velocities are indeed going to be in the positive direction. And the point that we want to make here is that uh, net particle displacements produce a wave that propagates upward in the negative direction, regardless of the initial displacements, so whether they're positive or negative. In this case, the initial particle displacements are going to be negative and in the not downward direction, which basically if we have, you know, kind of look back at this diagram where we formulated the uh, relationships uh, uh, between velocities and pressures and reflection coefficient and transmission coefficient, if the particles on the interface here start off at the leading edge of the wavefront by moving down. They're moving in the positive direction. That's going to produce a decrease in pressure. Conversely, if the particles are moving upward on the leading edge of the wavefront, that will produce an increase in pressure. They're leading upward in the, in the negative direction. Um, have negative sign, that will produce an increase in pressure. So, uh, <clears throat> so we've been thinking about the initial uh, particle displacements as, as uh, of course, you know, producing upward or downward uh, motion, uh, leading to uh, an increase or decrease in pressure, or vice versa. And uh, so, within the context of these previous developments and ideas, uh, we will just want to emphasize that the lead particle displacement in the reflected wave depends on the sign of the reflection coefficient. And the positive pressure reflection coefficient leads to a negative or upward particle displacement and increase in pressure on the upper side of the boundary. Conversely, a positive velocity reflection coefficient will produce a negative or a decrease in pressure uh, in the reflected wave. So. Okay, so this um, problem that we posed to you last time, um, we've got the reflection coefficient here for the pressure wave, which is 0.125, so we have a positive pressure wave reflection coefficient, we have a negative uh, velocity wave reflection coefficient, particle velocities. So the particle velocities actually start off by moving in the negative direction or upward direction as we have this increase in uh, pressure. And as we come down to this uh, second interface, the pressure wave reflection coefficient is negative and the velocity wave, particle velocity wave reflection coefficient is positive. So this leads to positive downward particle displacements along the leading edge of the upward propagating wavefront. 
So in your table, uh, hopefully you got something that looks like this. You can see that we have negative pressure wave reflection coefficients here. We have positive reflection coefficients for the particle velocity. Positive downward particle velocity. So we have a C produces a drop in pressure in the lead pressure wave reflection. And we can see that graphically here. I don't know whether you, you know, put together these kinds of plots uh, as we did the last time. The important takeaway from these uh, plots is basically the sign of the peak in the wavelet as it's uh, reflected or transmitted uh, from a boundary, through a boundary. You can see here for the pressure wave disturbance that we've got the transmission coefficient here, which is 1.125. So times 1, that gives us the pressure at B. And we have the reflection coefficient here between layers 2 and 3, giving us a negative reflection coefficient, which produces a drop in pressure on the wave going upward from the second interface. And we can see a drop in pressure continues in the upward direction. Uh, we have the two-way transmission losses packaged together here times the reflection coefficient uh, between layers 2 and 3 and uh, that gives us a minus 0.123 amplitude for the pressure at point D. For the particle velocities we have the opposite situation when we look at points C and D the particle velocity is actually positive which means that the particles are actually moving downward so and they're producing this negative, uh, they're producing this decrease in pressure uh, in the leading edge of the wavefront, which is propagating towards the surface. So we can see this sign flip here in graphically in the leading edge of the wavelet as it's reflected back towards the surface. However, remember these positive velocities represent uh, velocities along the leading edge of the wavefront, which are moving downward. Okay, um, you may have to you know, think about that and get familiar with those ideas, but let's take a look at some real data now. And this data comes from some Paleozoic uh, sedimentary rocks, and uh, you can see that we have a nice bell-shaped, Gaussian-looking distribution of reflectivity. And you can also see that these reflection coefficients are very small, which, you know, is... is good for us because the reflection coefficients, as you know, they control the two-way transmission loss. So if these reflection coefficients were always very large, we, we'd have trouble seeing anything. Uh, we'd have trouble getting energy back to the surface. So now if we look at the reflectivity variations as a function of depth, we can see that they, you know, in general, on average, they go back and forth about uh, uh, zero here with values that are a little bit less than 0 .2, 0 0.02, which is what we see here in this uh, distribution. However, occasionally we have these larger reflection coefficients. So what does this do? How does this manifest itself in the two-way transmission losses as we go from one end of the log to the other? Well, what we see is that we get this steady drop in the amplitude of the reflection from a deeper reflector associated with this two-way transmission loss. But we can also see something very interesting where we get these sudden drops or sudden transmission losses in some areas. Here and here and over here. And if we superimpose this uh, reflectivity series on top of the two-way transmission losses, we can see that these abrupt drops, these abrupt losses in reflection energy associated with a transmission loss occur or, or, are, or are associated with large reflection coefficients. So we have a series of large reflection coefficients here, positive, negative, positive, negative. We get this drop stepwise drop. Here we have a cluster of reflection uh, coefficients and you can see this rather significant uh, drop across this entire interval associated with this cluster of uh, 
rather large reflection coefficients. So as we can see here, these transmission losses are most significant in areas with larger reflection coefficients. Now, remember that, that um, when you look at a seismic section, you know, as an interpreter, you're probably, and we'll talk about, we'll remind you of the convolutional model here in a minute, but when you look at those reflection amplitudes, you're probably assuming that they're proportional to the reflection coefficient. But now you should realize that the reflection amplitudes that you see are not those of the reflection coefficient across a boundary, but they're scaled versions of our fractional um, amounts of our associated with these down and up two-way transmission losses through each layer all the way down, all the way back up to the, uh, to the surface as we see over here. So ideally the uh, processor is going to have to do something to this data, is going to have to correct it to remove these losses and you can see that that could be a difficult job. And the processor might try to do this using um, local well locks. And they might try to do it in a more general way using some kind of a polynomial or a exponential approximation to the drop in amplitude as a function of uh, two-way time. And you can see where that could present some problems as well. As we're smoothing across these variations, uh, we're probably going to miss something here and here and here. So. That's a, a difficult uh, task for the processor, but uh, be aware of that. That's what the pro that's the processor's job. The processor is responsible for doing the best they can to make the synthetic seismic trace, the reflections in the synthetic or the reflections in the actual seismic data, excuse me, uh, appear in proportion to the amplitude of the reflection coefficients. Now here we have a sparse reflection coefficient series, and this is just a reminder of the convolutional model. We know that the seismic signal is equal to a convolution of the wavelet. This is kind of a representation of convolution, a convolution of the wavelet with the reflectivity series. So we have this wavelet, and uh, we know ideally that the reflections are proportional to the reflection coefficient. And so when we look at the seismic signal, this signal here, which is a convolution of the wavelet with these reflection coefficients, ideally we'd like to look at the amplitudes here and assume, or at least have reasonable confidence that they're proportional to the reflection coefficients. And we know already that that's not going to be the case because uh, unless the processor has done a good job compensating for the two-way transmission losses, that will not be the case. It's also worth pointing out now, and we'll have to come back to this in the future, but um, these, in this case, we have the follow cycle of the reflection from this positive reflection coefficient here, the wavelet, is coincides with the onset of the reflection from this negative reflection coefficient here. So we actually get some cons constructive interference that suggests that maybe the reflection coefficient is not this, but something much larger. So this is referred to as constructive interference, and interference occurs both constructively and destructively. And uh, you can see over here another example of constructive interference. But now our uh, problem is that we're concentrating on is the transmission losses. This is the task that the processor has to deal with in some way. And uh, unless we you know, have uh, some effective means for removing the transmission losses, then we are not going to have a situation where the reflection amplitudes are proportional to the reflection coefficients, which is what we're after. So at this point, you may want to revisit some previous uh, videos uh, we, where we talked about the normal incidence seismogram. There's a couple videos, this uh, one on convolution with a problem, and also this one, uh, the normal incidence uh, synthetic seismogram. So these may, if you're, if you haven't looked at those uh, videos and you need some reminder of the, you know, the background on the convolutional model, these would be good 
videos to have a look at. And so in these discussions, we've emphasized that the two-way transmission losses, in effect, distort what you see in your seismic section as an interpreter. The reflection amplitudes are going to be reduced. And um, those amplitudes are really going to depend on the transmission losses that are encountered along the uh, propagation path. So next time we're going to consider other influences on the recorded amplitudes. We've mentioned them uh, uh, several times as we've talked about this plane wavefront assumption that we've been making, that there is no divergence, but we're going to have to incorporate divergence. And we're also going to have to incorporate uh, absorption or energy loss due to uh, the conversion of mechanical energy into heat energy. And again, this is, a, this is a task, this is an issue that the processor has to be aware of. You as an interpreter have to be aware of it as well because you need to work hand in hand with the uh, processor. So uh, uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us. Hope, hope this has provided some useful insights and uh, we'll see you next time.